Hello, and welcome to the eighth installment of the State of 911 webinar series being presented by the National 911 Program. My name is Colby Rackball, and I am support for the program. This webinar series was designed to offer 911 stakeholders information about ongoing federal and state 911 and NG 911 projects and provide, provide real experiences and best practices from early adopters about the NG 911 transition process currently underway across the country. Each webinar consists of a presentation from a federal level and a state level 911 stakeholder, with each being followed by a 10 minute Q&A session. At the end of the event, if there is time left over, we will open up the floor again to all questions. Following the event, a recording of the presentation along with the slides will be posted to the National 911 Program's website, www.911.gov. You can also visit the site to find information on past and future events, as well as to learn more about the National 911 Program. We will begin today's event with a presentation from the coordinator for the National 911 Program, Lori Flaherty, who will present a video on the benefits of NG911. Following the video, Ms. Flaherty will highlight other recently released products and programs, including the National Conference of State Legislators Summary of 2013 Enacted 911 Legislation and the release of the most recent version of NG911 Standards Identification and Review. Following a Q&A with Ms. Flaherty, Mr. Brian Carney, Communications Integration Branch Chief, National Regional Emergency Communications Coordination Working Group Coordinator, FEMA Disaster Emergency Communications Division, will present on opportunities for the 911 community to leverage the record for regional resources and information sharing. Oh. An open Q&A session will follow the presentation. Now I'd like to hand it off to Ms. Lori Flaherty, Coordinator for the National 911 Program. Thanks, Colby. Uh, and good day to everyone and welcome uh, to this uh, next installment of our webinar series. Uh, as Colby mentioned, we'd like to open today's session uh, with a video that we have recently released from the National 911 Program. We heard from you that you needed some help to explain what MG911 is. And so we worked with a contractor to develop this, wet, this uh, video. It's short, it's three minutes long, and it's chock full of information. We got all of that information from you. So without further ado, let's show the video. Allowing them to not only save lives, but to do 
Thank you. Uh, so if you go to 911.gov and you go to the NG911 page, that video is available to view. You can download it and uh, you can use it as you would like to. Uh, we, we've already heard from folks that they are using it in a variety of ways, whether it's to pre present the information to other state agencies, uh, to legislators, to the public. Uh, but the, one of the good things about the federal government is we don't copyright very much. So it is there for your use, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in terms of how you have used it. Moving along, we, we picked a number of things for today's uh, webinar. So I'm just going to carry on uh, with that list. The next thing that we have just recently released, uh, if you go to the next slide, is uh, a project that we have been working on for several years with the National Conference of State Legislators. Uh, they have been tracking 911 legislation for us for about three years and have maintained an online 911 legislation tracking database. It is a searchable database. It is searchable by keyword, by sponsor, by date, uh, and they update that database every two weeks uh, as legislation is introduced and enacted. And just recently, in January, they released a list of all of the laws related to 911 that were enacted during 2013. Uh, you can find that list. You can access that database by going to 911.gov, going to Exploring the Issues, and going to the Funding and Policy page of 911.gov. And there you will see the online database listed um, as a link, and you may go right to it. As a companion piece to that, uh, database, uh, we have also made available to you a document that contains guidelines for state NG911 legislative language. What we also heard from our constituents is that the statutes related to 911 were in dire need of update uh, with the move to digital IP-based infrastructure and what that means in terms of governance and operation. So we pulled together a group of stakeholders who put this document together. What it contains is uh, legislative language uh, in model form, along with references and background information. And the way they suggested that uh, folks use it at the state and local level is as a tool if you're, if you're going to inventory your, stat, your um, statute at the state or local level and uh, compare it against this model legislation. And then based on what your circumstances are, move forward with updating legislation or statute at the state and local level. Again, that document is available for your use at 901.gov by going to the funding and policy page of that website. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, the one technical piece that we have been working on for some time. There is a document on 901.gov now that really is a compendium of all the standards related to NG911. What we heard from you is that there really is no list of all the standards that relate to NG911, and we started tracking them about, uh, gosh, maybe eight or nine years ago. Uh, the information in this document has been checked and vetted with all of the standards development organizations whose information are enclosed. Um, so we, we have made sure that it is accurate. They all seem very pleased with the fact that uh, someone is keeping a list because, as you may know, standards development organizations are largely volunteer organizations and they pretty much have their hands full keeping track of what they are doing, much less what anyone else is doing. Uh, what you will find in that document besides technical standards are also uh, what we refer to as operational standards because, as you can see on the list there, the standards extend beyond the technical realm. So. There are standards related to products, interfaces, data, testing, performance, and operations contained in that document. 
And we have made a commitment to update that information every year. So this, this is this year's version. Uh, it was just released a couple of months ago. Um, so look for a yearly update on that document. The next thing that uh, we have recently made available is a final report on the grant program. For those of you that know, we, we administer or did administer a grant program specifically for 911 public safety answering points. Um, and if you get the question about where the money went and how the grantees used it, this uh, report will provide you with the answer. You can see there that there's a, there's a number of different types of information available. Um, you can see from just these two tables that the majority of the money was spent on infrastructure. It was spent on hardware and software, very little, in fact, in terms of the administration of this grant program. And the majority of it was used by grantees to move to the digital IP-based infrastructure that is the basis of NG911. There was some money used to update to uh, Phase 2 E911, uh, and, and a lot of states use the money for both. Um, some states did projects at the state level, which were for the benefit of all of their PSAPs. Some provided sub-grants to individual localities, uh, and some did both. So, what you'll find in this final report is uh, information on the grant program. And uh, if this grant program receives any further funding, it will happen after the auction uh, happens uh, next year. The spectrum auction happen happens at the FCC. So this report is available on the grants page of 911.gov. And that will also be where you will find updates on information related to the fun, any funding that might become available in the future after that spectrum auction has taken place. The next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, a project that we started a couple of years ago, and it is really uh, 911's first foray into collecting data at the national level. We asked states uh, a number of questions regarding basic demographics, like how many PSAPs do you have? Uh, we asked them cost information. We asked them how much of the population is covered by different phases of 911 technology. Um, and then in the second section of this data set, we asked them pretty specific information with regard to where they are in implementing NG911. Uh, because a lot of us get asked an awful lot, uh, where are the states in terms of implementing it and what do they need? And this was really our our attempt to gather that information so we can answer those questions and get you the help you need at the state and local level. Uh, once we collected that information, we also combined forces with the National Emergency Number Association, or NINA, because their state chapters also collect information on where the states are in terms of implementation of NG911. Although neither uh, database is complete uh, at this point in terms of all the states reporting, when we combined our data, you can see from this map that there were very few states that were not represented in terms of their progress. And uh, before you send me an email and tell me that your state information is not accurate, let me tell you that this is 2012 data. And we are currently in the process of uh, setting up the mechanism to collect last year's data, 2013 data. So we hope to be able to present an updated map and an updated report by the end of this calendar year. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is something that is not available yet, but will probably be available within the next month or so, and that is a report on 911 funding. Um, the FCC has an advisory group uh, that has been ongoing for some time now. Uh, and it's in its seventh year, in its fourth iteration, and a couple of uh, iterations ago, that they made a recommendation to the FCC that the FCC work with the National 911 program to develop some kind of report on alternative funding sources, uh, what I would refer to as potential uh, funding sources for 911. So we took sort of a different approach to this report. Uh, we decided that uh, if you ask the same people the same questions, you're going to get the same answers. And what we decided to do with this panel was, was try and get ideas from folks who have a really strong background in economics. 
So we brought people to the table from private equity firms, from other, other projects that funded large critical infrastructure within the government, uh, from folks that are within academia with a strong background in economics, and we asked them questions about, uh, you know, funding models that could be adapted for use in 911. Uh, so what you'll see in this report when it comes out is a list of their ideas for funding models that potentially could be used uh, to augment current funding models for 911. I can tell you that it is not uh, a silver bullet. Uh, I'm not sure that one exists, frankly. Uh, from this work and other work that we've been doing, it's pretty clear that everyone is struggling with how to pay for whatever it is that they're trying to provide, particularly in terms of the public sector. Um, but I think what you'll find in this document are, are some really interesting ideas. And we are in the process of uh, perhaps pursuing two or three of them and developing implementation guides that could be used by state or local government if they are interested in pursuing any of the ideas in this document. The next thing that we have been doing is we've been doing concerted outreach, particularly with the end users of the 911 system. You know, if you're, if you're trying to do the right thing, you sort of would like to begin with the end in mind. So uh, we, we have talked an awful lot with law enforcement, fire, and EMS about, you know, what they want from the 911 system. And uh, we thought it was important to do outreach, particularly with law enforcement first, out of that group. And the reasons are that uh, law enforcement is not only an end user of 911 information, but they run about half of the PSAPs in the United States. So they really have to be on board with uh, what's going on in 911 for things to move forward. So we worked with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the National Sheriff's Association to develop this 16-page supplement, which from their perspective presents a, a completely non-technical explanation of what NG911 is and how it will benefit the law enforcement community. Uh, we think, you know, the, the bond between law enforcement and 911 uh, first responders, frankly, and 911 is particularly important now uh, with the advent of FirstNet and as that public safety broadband network moves forward, uh, I've already told the folks that are working at that project at the national level that I will be hanging under their coattails every chance I get. And we've made strong recommendations to the states to make sure that the 911 folks are talking to the FirstNet folks as they move forward with their plans uh, to build that network so that information from the public can cross seamlessly across all of those networks to, to the first responders that really need that information. So. That law enforcement publication, as you can see, is uh, on 911.gov. In the lower right-hand corner of the home page, there's an announcements box, and you can click on the title of it if you would like to download it from our website. We also have a, a limited number of hard copies available, so um, you can email me for uh, hard copies. My contact information will be included at the end of my presentation. The next thing, uh, obviously, is the webinar series. You know, we heard from you that you, you can get to D.C. as often as you like, and you'd like to share your experiences as early adopters, whether it's of NG911 or text to 911. And so we will continue to make these webinars available to you in a bi-monthly fashion. Uh, they're usually an hour long. Usually they are, you know, the first half is presented by a Fed and then the second half by an early adopter, but we have changed that up from time to time. And they are uh, archived on the 911.gov website. So if you can't tune in when they are happening, um, they are there for you to listen to and to view at your convenience. And last uh, but not least, I'd like to make a pitch for National 911 Education Month. Uh, many of you might know that April has, was designated by Congress as National 911 Education Month. Uh, there is a coalition that has banded together for the purpose of gathering any kind of public education materials and making those available to as many people as we can. The website for that, as you can see on the slide, is no911.org, K-N-O-W-911.org. Um, so I'd encourage you to go to that site and look at the resources that might be available for to come in April. 
as National 911 Education Month. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, there's my contact information, and I think we have a few minutes if anyone has any questions. We'll just give folks a minute in case somebody would like to submit a question. And I do show we have one attendee with their hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute their line. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm curious. One of the big things in the NG911 is going to be bringing in, it looks like, things like your social media and other types of communication. Is that correct? Well, I, you know, there are, there are many places that are trying to figure out how to incorporate social media information into emergency response. Um, I, there is, frankly, at this point, not a national plan for that. We're watching very carefully to see what the state and local uh, PSAPs are doing. Uh, you know, there are places like the Red Cross that use it extensively, um, and I think they have a little bit of an advantage in that their their response is not quite as immediate as, you know, fire EMS and law enforcement, if you will. Um, and so they they have the option of collecting that information and, and, you know, trying to validate where it's coming from, trying to look for trends before they send their folks out. So I think there's a lot of interest in using that information. Um, they're trying to balance it against, uh, you know, any sort of malicious kind of use of that information, but it is definitely of great interest to the 911 community. Okay. Well, my question sort of goes, because I noticed – on the on the NG911, um, they're looking at being able to get like information in the way of pictures, uh, things along that line from uh, other sources. And my my real question is is what about the amateur community? Um, I'm an amateur radio operator myself. I work with Aries and Race. Um, we have also the ability now to transfer or transmit data packets mm -hmm. that are extremely secure and also be able to operate like from computer to computer via amateur radio waves rather than the normal internet. And I was just wondering if that was being looked at as part of this package. It, it is, you know, so if it can be digitized, uh, we're looking at it. Um, but, you know, in terms of the sort of like the evolution of NG911, um, probably uh, what uh, will happen first and because of the FCC's uh, recent actions and concentration on it is the text to 911. Um, and, but uh, I think it will be an evolutionary process that not only includes photographs, video, but other forms of data like advanced automatic crash notification. Um, there are alarm services that are looking to connect directly to 911. Um, and, and I think it will be sort of an iterative process, if you will, uh, because uh, as you can imagine, the addition of, of every kind of information, not only as technical, but operational implications for 911. So um, I think as things evolve, we'll be able to consider the full array of digital information. But yeah, absolutely, that's on the radar screen. All right, thank you so much. That was my only question. Okay, we do have one more question, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute that line. Okay, go ahead with your question, please.
Okay, it looks like they do not have a question. Great, and that's okay, all the hands that we have up. Thank you very much. At this point, I'm going to hand it back to Colby. Thank you. If there are no further questions. Um, I'd like to now let Ms. Larry to introduce Mr. Brian Carney, Communication Integration Branch Chief, National Regional Emergency Communications Coordination Working Group Coordinator, FEMA Disaster Emergency Communications Division. Thanks, Colby. It, it is my sincere pleasure to to have worked with Brian Carney for a number of years, uh, he is just an invaluable resource and, you know, frankly, a wonderful human being. He's extremely knowledgeable, um, and uh, we're lucky enough to get him uh, here today to share some information on the RECWIG and the 911 and RECWIG working together. So, Brian, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Lori. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, your audience. Uh, I was looking at some of the um, attendees that are online, and there were some uh, familiar names, both from our regional offices, but also from the 911 community that, that uh, have been involved with the Regional Emergency Communications Coordination Working Groups, which I'm going to speak to here in a, here in a couple of minutes. Um, please don't blame me for the acronym. Uh, the acronym RECWIG uh, was legislatively mandated uh, when, when uh, the legislation was put into effect that, that, that required the standing up of these working groups across the country. So I think I would have picked something that was a little bit easier to say, but, but uh, it does stick in people's minds. So again, my name is Brian Carney. I'm, uh, one of my major functions at FEMA is to assist in the coordination of this program, the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinating Working Groups across the country. And it's kind of been a, um, uh, a mission over the past six years to stand up these working groups and to make them a vital part in the uh, process of coordinating interoperable communications across the country at the various levels of government. And let, let me go ahead to the next slide, and I'll give you a little background. First, uh, with respect to the FEMA Disaster Emergency Communications uh, Division, uh, we are a division within headquarters FEMA also with tentacles out to the regions, the federal regions. Uh, our goal is stated here is to provide, uh, to build an effective disaster emergency communications program to improve the tactical communications and interoperable capabilities during disaster response. Um, fortunately, the legislative insight after Katrina that established and directed the, the standing up of the RECWIGs gave us an opportunity in a forum to really help us do our job, but more important, uh, to help support the departments and agencies and the local and state governments in getting their hands around uh, the huge issue of providing interoperable communications under all conditions. Um, we in our division have a, a number of tools in which we, you know, in which we use to help us facilitate our operational role, but also our, our bigger picture role, and that's supporting our state and local partners. First of all, we have our mobile, uh, FEMA mobile emergency response uh, support system. Um, many of you may have seen, you know, the big white trucks with FEMA logos uh, at various disasters with the big satellite dishes and, and uh, antennas. Those capabilities belong to FEMA DEC, Disaster Emergency Communications, and they're a headquarters managed capability uh, spread out across the United States in six locations across the United States that uh, we launch our support to the state and local response uh, requirements and also in support of our, our command and control the disaster response. Prior to Katrina, uh, and I'm kind of dropping down to the, to the second bullet. Prior to Katrina, uh, we provided that support, support really from the headquarters uh, level, you know, through our six detachments, mobile detachments. Uh, after Katrina, FEMA really recognized the need to have somebody belonging to the region that lived in the region on a day-to-day -day basis that was responsible for developing 
relationships at the state and local level uh, with respect to interoperable communications, to finding out how you all operate, what you might need in a disaster, but to have somebody there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we established 10 positions across the 10 federal regions. Uh, those, those positions or those uh, branches have actually grown to include more than just the Regional Emergency Communication, uh, Communications Coordinator. Uh, and now we have eyes and ears within each one of the federal uh, FEMA regions to help us facilitate that support during a disaster. The third bullet is really the, the focus of my discussion today, and that is the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinating Working Groups, RECWICs. Through legislation uh, after Katrina, Congress determined that it was important regionally for state, local, federal entities to work together and to have a forum by which the requirements for interoperable communications could be facilitated, coordinated, analyzed um, on an ongoing basis. They directed the establishment, Congress directed the establishment of 10 RECWIGs, one in each of the federal regions. Let me go ahead to the next slide. As I said, it was congressionally mandated, but one point I want to make clear before we go on, and I'll, there seems to be some public safety people in the background, <laughs> sirens going on, I'm sure you all hear that. But one thing I want to make clear uh, right up front with respect to the rec leagues is that these working groups are not FEMA working groups. FEMA is the designated agency to support the facilitation of those working groups, to ensure that they are provided the, the uh, administrative support, technical support uh, for these bodies to work, but they do not belong to FEMA. Uh, they are standalone working groups that report the state of interoperable communications planning issues, uh, concerns, up through our regional administrators through an annual report process, and that report is then pulled together on a national perspective, but is never edited from the perspective of changing the recommendations or the advice of the membership. That report then goes up to the chairman of the FCC, the assistant secretary of trans, uh, assistant secretary for communications from the from, uh, Department of Commerce, and also the director of the Office of Emergency Communications, and is also provided to Congress a as they request. And it provides insight to uh, what the ground level truth or what the ground level uh, concerns are and, and um, successes are and challenges are for those of us that are in the business of providing interoperable commun communications uh, under any conditions. Uh, this working group provides a key coordination venue, and it encourages collaboration among the diverse uh, membership. And in a minute, I'll get to, you know, what Congress for, uh, provided as their guidance of what the membership of each one of these rec wigs should look like. Uh, the first two bullets, are kind of the primary uh, reasons why the rec wigs exist. The last three uh, really are some side benefits, not only to the individuals that are the organizations that belong to the rec wigs, but also to the disaster response community and the FEMA community. You know, we sit on the rec wigs, we are advisors to the rec wigs, and we are participants to the process. Uh, and, you know, from our perspective, knowing where each state and local entity is with respect to uh, how well they can communicate in disaster situations is beneficial to us. But it's not just about disaster situations. It's a day-by-day -day, uh, environment that these working groups are, are directed to advise the process um, to make sure that we continue to advance. Uh, and, and we can continue to communicate and, and, and uh, do things as we need to under any conditions. 
The federal entities that are a part of the RECWIGs, such as FCC and NGIA and Department of Transportation, they're there as advisors to the process and as partners, but they are not the ones that direct the, the issues to be examined and the um, recommendations to be given. Let me go to the next slide, which, uh, which provides a summary of the RECWIG memberships and the partners. Uh, this is drawn from the legislation that, it, that established uh, the RECWICs. And I, you know, and, and not, not to, to sound too, um, uh, well, it's very insightful. Congress really understood after Katrina that solutions for interoperable communications have to come from the, the, the local level, the state level, and had to inform the federal level in order for things to get better. Okay? If you look on the left side of this, of this slide, you'll see uh, a listing of non-federal uh, organizations, and this is the true core of the membership that Congress wants each RECWIG to have. State officials state level, also local government officials, including people like sheriffs and, and uh, fire chiefs and 911 uh, directors and 911 operators, um, state police departments, local police departments. And as I go through this list and as you look at the list, you'll realize that, that these are the ones that are at the site of a disaster, at the site of an issue or an incident, and they're the ones that are pushing the push to talk switch to talk, and they're the ones whose lives are on the line and who are also saving the lives uh, of, of uh, the people that are affected by the incident. When Congress looked at this non-federal membership, they weren't just looking for membership from the perspective of uh, communications engineers and RF engineers. Yes. We want that in the working group. But we're also looking for the folks that use the communications capabilities, the ones that can say, I'm sorry, person who is building the grant programs and who is providing this direction from on high, you don't quite get it. Here is my problem, okay? And it's through that kind of membership uh, that that we're finding the interaction in these working groups is truly experiencing kind of a, you know, a, a wide eyes open kind of approach. On the right hand side, there were some federal departments and agencies that Congress said needed to be at the table at these regional emergency communications coordinating committees uh, at, at each one of these. They of course said FCC. And in all of the 10 regions, we have FCC participation. Uh, the department, uh, the uh, national communication system during the time of uh, this legislation that was being, being uh, put forward was also a, a, an organization that was on, identified. That organization has since um, combined its capabilities with the Office of Emergency Communications. Uh, the FCC, FEMA was a, a, a uh, agency that was deemed um, necessary at the table for each one of these because of our, our unique role in disaster response. But the federal participation is not limited to those organizations. In each one of the regions, depending on the level of federal participation in the overall environment, uh, determines the federal participation. For example, in Region 8, uh, which is, where our regional office is out of uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, Department of Interior is a big player in that whole region, and Department of Interior plays a role in the Region 8 uh, RECWIC. Additionally, an area of partnership that Congress has identified that is important for the overall process is the partnership with the public and private sector, the telecommunications industry, the IT industry. This is an area that, that we have made some progress in in the last five years, 
but we are looking as a goal for the future to increase the level of, of industry participation in these working groups. And there's absolutely, there's no hesitation on the part of industry to be a part of this. It's, it's our role to reach out and bring them in. Let me go ahead to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, membership diversity. And it's been a, it's kind of been a project of, of um, it's been a, a process over the past several years to build the membership into what Congress has envisioned. That are we where we want to be in all regions? Probably not. Are we going in that right direction? Yes. Currently we have around 250 members representing state, local, territorial interests across the 10 regions. Some uh, regional rec wigs have anywhere from 20 to 40 active participants at the state and local levels. Some have smaller uh, representation. All, I will say, across the 10 regions have made progress in, in developing the membership so as to provide the true insight into what's needed. RecWig leaders, uh, and, and as I said, FEMA does not own the RecWigs. In a number of the RecWigs, the co-chairs for the, for the RecWigs are state and local representatives. And from a personal perspective, I believe that those are some of the most successful RecWigs because they bring uh, that perspective to the leadership level within the RecWigs. Also within each, each region, uh, since uh, Katrina, has been the establishment of the state position of statewide interoperability coordinators, SWICs. And if you, if you aren't aware of who your state SWIC is, I, I suggest you go to the Office of Emergency Communications uh, website and identify that individual. Uh, we, FEMA, look towards the SWIC in each state and also the emergency management organization within each state to be the spearhead for initiating membership within the rec wings. Uh, we, FEMA, will gladly uh, take uh, recommendations from our partners, such as those that are around this webinar uh, table today, but we will pass those recommendations to our state SWIC and our emergency management organization because it's the state level and the local level that drive the membership, uh, you know, for the rec wings. We, FEMA, aren't going to be in the, in the position of saying who should be on the rec wings. That truly is um, a philosophy that we hold to and we look for the SWIC and the State Emergency Management Office to assist in the development of the membership. Okay. Um, there is strong support for local users. Uh, as I said, uh, specifically two of our RecWIC co-chairs are local, not, even, not state, but local levels, and it does provide a unique perspective. RecWIC membership continues to grow year over year. Uh, but it's something that uh, we continually have to um, in, encourage because, you know, it, normally we, we, we look for a turnover every two or three years within the membership, uh, but we'll never turn anyone away that, that has been a productive and an active member. And, of course, you know, the state is always encouraging, you know, that level of uh, participation. Next slide. So kind of in, in, in summary, um, the records are there for forums in each one of the 10 regions. We have a facilitator, a FEMA employee, who is the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinator, uh, one in each of the federal regions. They can be your interface or your touchstone to uh, to to access the process, but they will refer your name if you want to participate to the, uh, to the state SWIC or the emergency management office within, within your region. Uh, opportunities for your participation, 
most of the regional emergency communications coordination working groups have one to two plenary sessions a year. Those plenary sessions are where we actually gather together face to face. There is there is some invitational money that is available through FEMA for the membership. There is also money available through this through the Homeland Security grant programs that would be initiated through the state coordination because governance uh, organizations such as RecWigs are recognized as a as a, a um, allowable expense. We also have on a, for the most part in, in the regions, monthly to quarterly conference calls where uh, RecWig memberships and working groups out of, out of the sub-working groups out of the working group uh, RecWigs get together via conference call and webinars to discuss specific issues that they want raised and addressed in the plenary session, but also through the annual report process so that Congress has, has, a, has a window into your concerns. And also, more importantly, for each of us to share best practices back and forth to discuss how we can make things better. Um, the 911 community has been well represented across the Requiem community. Uh, I would hope that in the future they will be even better represented because you provide a, a true insight into some ground level uh, requirements and issues and concerns. As Lori mentioned, uh, with the movement with FirstNet and the establishment of of a broadband network across the country for public safety. Uh, we are looking, or the RecWigs are looking to collectively provide insights at the operational level for the benefit of the development of FirstNet. We're working closely with the FirstNet organization to develop a national uh, webinar and an information flow between the RecWigs uh, because there is a vast amount of not only operational experience, but technical experience and true ground-based truth knowledge of what's, of it, what's important. We don't want to build interoperability from the headquarters level. If we do that, it's not going to be interoperable. We need to develop the process, procedures, the relationships, and also the technical capabilities of interoperability starting at the ground level. And I believe if you, for those of you that are on the line that have been a part of the RecWig process, please feel free to, to chime in when we get here, open it up to questions. Um, being in a forum where you have cross-cutting disciplines and expertise is just a unique place to understand the problem, and then to help everyone solve the problem. So with that, I think I will put up my contact information. Um, if you wish to contact me as far as additional information on the RecWigs and identify what region or state you're in, I can also provide you that uh, contact information back to our regional emergency communications coordinators so that they can help you be a part of this process. Any questions? We have any 911 folks out there that, that, that are a part of the process? Do we have a question? I think they dropped off the line. Oh no, I've been on mute the whole time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think they for the for the question to have my contact information is back up. Yeah, I asked a question. 
Yes. Um, you talked a lot about um, kind of how you kind of gather folks to become members. Are there any specific requirements to become a member? Obviously, I know that you talked about you know local police and fire and, and those sorts of folks. But is there any other requirements for actually becoming a member? To be involved in the public safety community, uh, to be um, identi identified by your state and emergency management organization as a representative that can speak to a, a an area of expertise. Okay. It, it, there aren't any uh, defined criteria because who better to know who they want around the table than the state and local representatives involved in public safety communications and the state emergency management organization and the state interoperability coordinator. We, we will not put out a list of you have to have this. It's really um, a state and local call. Okay, there's a okay. question. We do have one question from an attendee, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute their line. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I was curious who the uh, Red Wing uh, point of contact is in Nevada, or do we have one? Now, our FEMA Regional Emergency Communications Coordinator uh, for Nevada, which is in Region 9, is Mr. David Benoit. Uh, the state SWIC, uh, I, I don't know all 50 names by, by heart, uh, so the state SWIC, you can, statewide interoperability coordinator, uh, you can go to the OEC, Office of Emergency Communications uh, website, and I believe they have a listing of all the current SWICs uh, within that region. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. And, it, and, sir, if you send me an email, I will get you the email contact from Mr. David Benoit. Are there any other questions? And it looks like at this time I see no other uh, verbal questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Carney, and thanks again, Tim, for your clarity. Thank you all for attending today's presentation. We look forward to your participation in future State of 911 webinars. The next installment will be Wednesday, May 7th at noon Eastern with presentations from both state and federal stakeholders. Registration for this event will open up in early April. Again, for more information on the National 911 program or to view a recording of this or past events, see this please visit our website at www.911.gov. Thanks again. Just one closing remark. We will be sending the video and the slides that we went through today out to all of the participants. So thank you again for joining.